I was on the trail of a monster, one with fangs and a taste for humans. This vampire had attacked a monster hunter that I knew. It had bitten him, changing him, making him the monster. Only he had chosen oblivion over a future as a vampire. He had walked out into the sunlight and been burned away to dust. Night had fallen by the time that I began my pursuit. I was trying not to think about the fact that I had never hunted a vampire before. When I met the monster hunter, I was a security guard, a loser on minimum wage, who had gotten himself fired. That was then, I told myself. Now, the only thing that mattered was revenge. I would make the vampire pay for what it had done. First, I had to find the fiend. I paced the bleak rain-swept city into blind rage for hour after hour. I broke into derelict buildings and searched filthy alleyways and found nothing but dead ends. By dawn, I was no closer and I knew by then that the vampire would be hidden away. It would be in a coffin somewhere to escape the light. To have any chance of finding it, I needed to wise up, to think. I recalled how the vampire had killed the monster hunter in its own act of revenge, after he had taken out one of its kin in a seedy bar. I would go there. It was miles away and I was beat, so I stuck on my arm to hail a taxi. Three cabs with their light on drove straight past me. I did not know why. I wasn't wearing anything out of the ordinary apart from maybe the fedora the monster hunter had given me just before he had died. But then I realized the reason none of them wanted me as a passenger. I was holding a wooden stake. Its tip was sharp, ideal for ending a vampire, and guaranteed to make cab drivers give me a wide berth. I put the stake under my coat, held it in place with one of my arms, while with the other I tried again to fly down a taxi. At last, one pulled over to the sidewalk, trying not to stab myself in the chin with the stake, and trying not to look weird while I was doing it. I got in. The cab driver did not want to take me all the way to the bar because of the reputation of the district that it was in. I did not blame him and ended up walking the last mile. Layers of graffiti covered the walls and cars were parked up on street corners with music blaring out. I stopped hiding the stake, looking like a crazy it was an insurance policy on these mean streets. I made it to the bar without being hassled. There were no windows and the door was closed. The place was a seedy enclave, a refuge for loners and sometimes creatures of the night. I wondered if the vampire that I was seeking might be in there. It would be safe from the light of day. And I knew from my previous visit that the bar sold plasma as well as cheap beer. The customer is always right no matter how disturbing their needs. One of the few useful things that I had learned when I was a security guard was how to pick locks. And the lock on the bar's door was as shoddy as the rest of the place. In less than a minute, I was inside. The only signs of life were the flies buzzing around the flickering strip lamp in the ceiling. The place stank as well, of stale sweat and old cigarette smoke. It looked like somebody had made a passing attempt at cleaning up after the night before. Chairs were upended on tables and broken glass had been swept up into a pile in one corner. That was good for me. I could walk through the bar without stepping on any shards and broadcasting my presence. I headed for a back door which was propped open by a chair. As I came closer, I heard the sound of snoring. There was someone outside whose dreams were about to be rudely interrupted. I stepped over the chair and into a backyard that was littered with more broken glass and empty beer cans, mounds of cigarette butts and empty pizza boxes. A rat sat in one of the boxes, licking the base. It ignored me and I ignored it. I wanted to speak to the other vermin in the yard. The barman who I recognized from the last time that I was there was fast asleep in a deck chair. A cigarette hung out of his open mouth and drool dripped from his chin. 
I kicked his leg. He sat up with a grunt and looked at me with bloodshot eyes. You are going to tell me, I growled, where to find a particular vampire. Is real pale or real ugly? Favors black for his attire and he attacked an associate of mine. Oh yeah, he growled back. I know the bloodsucker you're talking about. He was in here bragging about what he had done. But there's no way I can betray him. My life would not be worth living. I put the tip of the wooden stake against his chest. Now, I said, I know that if I impale you with this, you won't crumble into dust because you're not one of the undead. But I imagine that it will hurt real bad and likely prove fatal. You don't need to worry about no vampires, mister. You need to worry about me. He gulped, his Adam's apple moving inside his scrawny neck. Okay, he said. The dude with the fangs that you're looking for likes to sleep at the morticians on the corner, two blocks along from here. It's a big old building with a horse parked in front. Can't miss it. Sounds like a real charming place, I said. Does the mortician know that he's got vampires on the premises? He sure does, the barman replied. He's got plenty of spare coffins and the vampires pay him to watch over them while they're asleep. Protect them from scum like you. He spat these last words out. Fresh anger flared inside me, but I held it in. He was human garbage but my sole aim was to take out the vampire. The rest of the filth inhabiting the city could rot. Mighty grateful, I drawled and left him scowling. The morticians was easy to locate. The buildings around it were run-down homes. Paint was peeling off of the walls. Windows were boarded up in some. Resting cars sat in the overgrown yards of others. The morticians was constructed of stone and had a faded grandeur. The hardest part in front of it looked like it belonged to a different age. One where men wore top hats and a lady showing an ankle was considered risque. It sat in its own grounds and there was no way to sneak up on it. So I decided to walk straight up to the front door. I tried the handle. Locked. But it was also easy to pick so I went right on in. My heart was beating fast as I looked around. There were chairs lined up against a wall, a table with a bowl of wilting flowers in it and two doors, leading off from what I took to be a reception area. I mentally tossed a coin and opened the door on the right. I led into a wide and low-ceilinged room. A candle flickered in one corner, illuminating half a dozen coffins resting on stands. I tried the lid of the nearest one. It slid away easily to reveal the coffin, empty. I took a breath and moved on to the rest. The next one was empty. I pushed away the lid of the third coffin and my skin began to tingle. There was a body lying in the coffin. It was dressed in all black and its skin was drained of color. Its mouth was closed but I knew that behind those pale lips there were fangs. My hands were shaking badly as I lifted the stake and placed its sharpened tip on the vampire's chest above where its undead heart would be. This hideous creature had destroyed the monster hunter, and now I would destroy it. But I could not do it. I could not push the stake into its heart. For all I wanted revenge, this felt like such a vicious thing to do. I closed my eyes, told myself that I had to strike. And then I heard a door creak and span around, to find myself face to face with an old man. The mortician it must have been. He was pointing a revolver at me and there was a cold smile on his liver-spotted face. You have my sincere condolences, he said. What for? I managed to ask. For your imminent death, he told me. My guts tightened. I had missed the chance to destroy the vampire and now I was about to get a bullet in the brain. The mortician's icy stare hardened as he added, If sir would like to step this way, I will prepare you for your grave. He pointed the barrel at a connecting door. I dropped the stake and raised my hands and headed that way.
I found myself in a room dominated by a narrow table and shelves stacked with dusty bottles full of dark liquids. At the head of the table there was a silver tray with scalpels, plastic tubes and a surgical saw. The kind of equipment that a psychopath would need. The mortician laughed at the horrified expression on my face. I would assure you that you won't feel a thing, he said, but that would not be true. Now lie on the table so I can make a start. I stayed on my feet. What are you going to do? There's no money in simply burying bodies anymore, he answered. So I have diversified. I have my vampire guests and I also have a thriving sideline in providing body parts to clinics. Eyes, kidneys, hearts, all the organs that they will buy for patients, willing to do anything to enhance their miserable, disease-riddled lives. I can make a few thousand dollars from you and afterwards the vampire can have your blood with the compliments of the house. Which is quite enough talking. Get in your back, it's cutting time. My options were bleak. Fight back and die or submit and be turned into spare parts. I was trying desperately to decide when the door burst open and a man strode in. He wore a pinstripe to suit and carried a cane. I am here for the vampire, he said. Can either of you gentlemen tell me where it is? In response, the mortician grabbed a scalpel and lunged at the dapper intruder, who neatly sidestepped the attack and chopped the mortician's neck with the side of his hand. The mortician crumpled to his knees and then fell forward flat into his ugly face. He was unconscious. The man in the pinstripe suit turned to me and said in his clipped, precise tones, Do we also have a problem? No, I told him. I'm here for the vampire as well. The man in the pinstriped suit frowned. In that case, we might have an issue after all. He took a sheet of paper out of his jacket pocket and showed it to me. There was a mugshot of the vampire on it with a dollar sign followed by four figures printed below. Once I had the chance to take this in, he continued, I am the operative who has been assigned to hunt this monster down and the fee is mine. I understand, I told him. I don't care about the money. All I want is revenge. A small smile flickered across his lips as he said, Well, that's very noble of you, but every monster has its price in cold hard cash, and that is my priority. So, what is it going to be? Do we fight for the right to impale? I thought back to how I had been unable to finish the vampire off, hating myself for it, but knowing that it was the right thing to do, I said, The vampire is through there. And then I left him to it. The monster hunter's death had been avenged, albeit by the hand of another, and yet all I felt was emptiness. I had been a failure when this had started, and I was still a failure. Alone and broke with no purpose in life anymore. As I had done before, I drifted, while the world happened around me. Everybody seemed to have somewhere to go to, somebody to speak to, everyone except for me. Eventually, I found myself back at the rundown building which the monster hunter had used as his base. I went inside, through the fedora, onto the floor and collapsed onto the battered sofa that sat in the center of the room. My eyes began to close, and I was so tired and on the verge of tears. The worrying sound of a fax machine made me sit up. The monster hunter had avoided modern technology because he did not trust it. He had pointed out that hackers were constantly on the virtual prowl, around emails and messaging apps, but that no one was looking out for faxes. They were old school and obsolete, and thus you were a freelance operative being paid by the government to eliminate monsters. Despite my failure earlier, was this something that I could do? I wondered. And if people who sent the faxes had not realized the monster hunter was dead, could I take his place? With these questions weighing down on me, I dragged myself to my feet and went to see what was printed on the paper being dragged through the fax machine. Two sheets of A4 ended up in the tray. 
The first one had a mugshot of a man with short, tidy hair wearing glasses. He looked like the least threatening person that I had ever seen. And yet the fee for his elimination was into the five figures. I gripped the paper tighter when I read that. If I could do this one job successfully, I would have more money than I had ever had in my life. I moved on from the dollars and turned to the next page where a last known address and its monster classification was given. I knew the address. It was a cemetery on the edge of the city, and the man in the mugshot was a zombie. My hands were shaking as I folded up the papers and put them in my pocket. I picked the fedora up and the equipment that I would need from a cabinet, and then took a deep breath. All I had to do was eliminate a zombie. How hard could it be? I kept telling myself that all the way to the graveyard. When I arrived, it was clear straight off where the zombie had emerged from. One of the plots was surrounded by a flimsy perimeter of tape, similar to that the police used to crime scenes. The earth in the plot was broken open and just the headstone remained intact. A scrawny man dressed in overalls was standing nearby leaning on a shovel. I wandered over and said, I'm working for the government, can you tell me what happened? He was chewing tobacco and worked it around his mouth before he replied. Yeah, about dang time, I've been telling everybody something bad would happen, but no one ever listened to me, they never do. Dang fools. Well, I'm here, I said patiently, and I'm prepared to listen. He turned and pointed into the distance. It's all because of that river. It broke its banks a few days ago after all the rain we've had and the land in the graveyard was flooded. The river water seeped right down into the earth, right down into the graves. Now most times this would be pesky but no big deal. But that's bad water in that river you see. It's heavy with pollution discharged from the chemical plant about two miles upriver from here. And what did the polluted water do here? I asked, gesturing at the disturbed grave. A disgusting wad of tobacco landed on the ground close to my feet. He wiped the back of his hand across his mouth and continued chewing as he spoke. Oh, I had done brought that young man back from the dead. I seen it with my own eyes. Clawing its way out, no longer a human being but one of them zombies like they got in the games down at the arcade. It climbed right out and then staggered off. I had almost everything that I needed. Just one more thing, I said. Which way did the dead man go? He pointed in a new direction. That way, towards the highway, maybe looking to hitch a ride. I pity the poor fool that gives that bundle of decaying body parts a lift. I thanked him for his time and set off walking towards the highway. When I arrived, I saw that it was a long, bleak strip. There wasn't a truck in sight. Along the road, I could see a lone building. Lights flickering on its roof. It spelled out diner. I headed that way. From the outside, the diner looked filthy. Its windows were covered in grease and water dripped from a broken gutter. And somebody was pushing open the door. Not someone, I realized, with a jolt of adrenaline, but something. As the zombie shuffled inside, a little bell above the door rang. I followed. The diner's interior was foul. Its tables were covered in a red plastic that was cracking and peeling away. There were scraps of food on the floor and there were flies everywhere. They crawled over the tables and along the walls, and flew around the head of the latest customer drawn in by the decay. The object of their attention, the zombie was shuffling towards the counter. A man wearing an apron that had been white decades ago had his back to the counter and was flipping patties on a hot plate. The zombie slapped a hand down onto the counter. Hey, hold your horses there, fellow. The man in the apron said. He turned and asked, All right, what can I get you? The zombie's voice when it answered was low and distorted. Brains. The man in the apron shook his head as he replied. We don't serve no brains. I can do you a burger with onions, a fries or a hot dog, but no brains. 
The zombie was not interested. And brains. Its voice rumbled like the prelude to a storm. I need brains. I decided to intervene. I took off the sawn-off that I had taken for the cabinet and tapped the zombie on the back with the barrel. How about you hurry it up a little, I said. Some of us haven't got all day. The zombie turned. I could still recognize the man in the glasses from the mugshot. The man that it had once been. Now its skin was gray and breaking open in places. I could see the flesh beneath and patches of the decay that was beginning to consume it. And I wondered how inbred ugly the regular customers at the diner must have been. I mean, the man in the apron had embatted an eyelid when he first saw the zombie. Yet most people would have run screaming at the sight of its horrific face. A face that was leaning in towards me. Brains, it said, a glimmer of hope in its hideous tone. Not today, I replied and placed both barrels against its forehead. I knew that if the movies and TV series were right, I needed to destroy its own brain to end the thing. My finger moved to the trigger, but once again, I couldn't do it. This thing had once been a living and breathing person. The zombie's mouth opened, revealing gray teeth from which drool hung. Its fetid breath struck me, and I felt bile rising inside me and my limbs freezing as fear took over. And then it moved in closer. It was about to bite me and I could not move. Suddenly, there was a blur of movement behind the zombie. It was the man in the apron swinging a frying pan at the back of the zombie's head. He connected. The zombie groaned and turned away from me to see what had hurt it. I had my second chance and I took it. In the aftermath of the impact, matter flew everywhere. It was parts of the zombie's skull and its brain, I realized, as I wiped some off of my face. And it was not just me. It was all over the walls and the man in the apron. Part of the zombie's brain had even ended up on the hot plate and were beginning to sizzle. I think I've lost my appetite. I sat and walked away. Back at base, there was a fax waiting for me. It had one word typed on it. Update. I wrote, Zombie eliminated, requesting payment, and I sent the fax back. A few minutes later, I had the details that I needed. I took a shower to clean off the zombie remains and found a change of almost clean clothes from the pile that the monster hunter had left in the floor. I also found an ankle-length leather coat hanging in a closet. Must have been a spare for the one that the monster hunter wore. I tried it on for size and it fitted me perfectly. I smiled, put the fedora back on, and I went to go get paid. I had been told that the cash had been left in a briefcase in a locker at the train station. As tired and stressed commuters filed past behind me, I glanced in the briefcase and saw the stacks of banknotes. My heart soaring, I closed the locker and, looking as casual as I could, I walked away. There was no way that I could deposit that amount of money in a bank, so I went back to my base and I hid it in various places. And then I waited. Although I was now cash rich, I was hooked on monster hunting and wanted another assignment. As the hours passed and nothing came through on the fax machine, my mind had wandered. I thought about the chemical plant that was supposedly discharging substances into the river that could reanimate the dead. Was that really the case? I had wondered. I looked back at the fax machine. Still silent. So I got to my feet and put the fedora and coat on. It was time to get proactive and go see for myself what was really happening at the chemical plant. And maybe I would get lucky. Maybe there would be some monsters in the max. I walked through the night enjoying the sense of freedom that I felt now that I didn't have to worry about money. Soon, I was skirting the edge of the graveyard and following the course of the river. There was a rank smell rising from the water, but that was not that uncommon in rivers in built-up urban areas. I needed to get to the source, to the plant itself. 
It was a squat, sprawling concrete structure surrounded by a steel fence. Signs were placed in the fence, warning of 24-hour surveillance and guard dogs. I knew from my own experiences as a security guard that this was a bluff. The reality was that somebody would make a half-hearted tour of the perimeter of the building once a night and then move on. I found a break in the fence and I slipped through. There was a door ahead of me. It had its own sign saying, Fire door, keep closed at all times. The door was propped open with a plastic barrel, with the symbol for hazardous substances on its side. I stepped inside and found myself in a brightly lit open space. There were more of the barrels, some lying on their side. Dark liquid pooled on the floor in places and in the distance, I could hear voices. I moved towards this, an adrenaline junkie in search of their next hit. At the far end of the space, a couple of the people deep in conversation suddenly walked into view. I ducked down out of sight behind a stack of barrels and listened as the first one said, These test subjects better be viable. I am getting it in the neck for management for all the rejects that we've had to throw on the river. His companion merely grunted in reply. They had reached a door with a panel next to it. The companion punched in a series of numbers and the door slid silently open. After they had gone through the door, it remained open. I crept forwards, slipped through, and crouched low to hide behind a steel cabinet. The men that I had followed were oblivious to me. They were walking along a row of beds, and each bed was occupied. If this had been a hospital ward, the scene before me could have been a couple of doctors doing the rounds. Only the patients in this building were strapped to their beds, and they were writhing and groaning. I recognized that sound from my encounter in the diner and a cold chill ran down my spine. This wasn't a chemical plant. It was some kind of twisted zombie production line. The two men were making notes and shaking their heads. They didn't seem happy. Finally, with their inspection complete, the two men left the room. On the other side of the door, one of them tapped in a code and the door slid shut. I straightened up, and I moved over to the beds and the things being held prisoner. There were five of them in all in various stages of decay. The sickly sweet smell of rotting flesh was heavy in the air, and as each of them noticed me, they struggled harder against their restraints. These were made of thick leather and slotted into metal holders. For a moment, I considered trying to free them, but I dismissed that idea. These were no longer men. They were monsters, who would attack and bite me and devour my brain, given the slightest chance. I decided the best thing to do was to get out of there and alert the government by fax. I turned to leave, and as I did, an alarm began to howl and an intercom high in the wall of the room buzzed into life. Attention. You are not authorized to be on this site and will be dealt with accordingly. I swore. The voice over the intercom went on. You will now be a participant in our research program. I will not, I yelled back, but I got no reply. Instead, the intercom cut out and the straps holding the zombies down were automatically released. I was trapped. A human subject for a test to see what five zombies would do to one helpless victim. I watched in horror as the zombies sat up. They moved slowly, as if trying to remember how to work their bodies. Their hands twitched and reached out and they seemed to be struggling to focus. One zombie which had made it to its feet, stumbled and fell into the one next to it. The zombie lashed out with its arm and within seconds, both were snarling and trying to bite each other. The other zombies just sat there and watched blankly. It was clear this batch of zombies was a failure. Without warning, the door slid open and a man wearing a lab coat had walked into the room. He wore an expensive looking suit underneath the coat. An entourage, dressed in security uniforms followed, all carrying poles with plastic loops at the top. Careful to keep their distance, they snagged the zombies around the neck and dragged them out of the room. Such a waste, the man in the lab coat said as he watched them go. But we will try again, starting with you. No way, I shot back. You're not going to turn me into a zombie. Oh, it's not your choice. 
You forfeited all your rights the moment you trespassed on my property. You'll never get away with this. Oh, I will. I make generous donations to political campaigns and employ a large number of local people at my other businesses. Money makes the world go round, and money makes the authorities look the other way. You are mine to do with as I choose. He laughed and walked out of the door. One of his entourage on the other side started to tap in the code that closed the door. I had one chance to act. The long leather coat had deep pockets. They were ideal for storing equipment that a monster hunter might need. Such as a wooden stake which I took out and threw towards the door. It landed on the floor in the gap before the door had a chance to close, holding it open. But not by enough for me to squeeze through. I ran at the door, shoulder barged it, and I was out. The entourage and the man in the lab coat were already gone, apart from the man who had been left to enter the code and the door. He looked at me in shock and then reached for a taser hanging from his belt, but he didn't make it. My fist connected with his face. I heard and felt bone breaking. His, not mine. He did not cry out. His legs gave way and he collapsed onto the floor out for the count. I jumped over him and ran back through the space and the propped open door. When I arrived back at my base, I was coated with sweat and adrenaline was still pumping through my veins. I was a man on a mission. I was going to alert the government to what was happening at the plant, and then this evil operation would be taken out of business. The man in the lab coat and his lackeys would go to prison for a very long time. Justice would prevail. I went inside to find somebody waiting for me. He was wearing a pinstriped suit and held a cane. It was the monster hunter who had saved me from the mortician and eliminated the vampire. What are you doing here? I asked. He took a piece of paper out of his pocket and showed it to me. There was a mugshot on it. Of me. I don't understand, I said, my voice shaking. I'm terribly sorry, old chap. I've been assigned to eliminate you. But I'm not a monster. Oh, the system says you are. And once you're in the system, there's only one way out. He lifted his cane and unscrewed a cap from the end, revealing a hideously sharp dagger. I'll make this quick, he said. No, I begged him. I've uncovered a facility that is making zombies. The man who runs it thinks that he's above the law because he's rich. He's behind this as well, he must be. The system is corrupt, and you're being used by it to kill an innocent man. He stared at me, and then slowly put the cap back over his dagger. I barely know you, he said, but I believe that you're an honest person, a good person, and I've had my suspicions for some time about those who pay me to eliminate monsters. So I'm going to lie and tell them that I eliminated you and take the fee. And then maybe find a new career. Maybe back home in England. He gestured towards the door with his cane and continued. You should leave as well. They have eyes everywhere and there's a good chance they'll discover that I let you go. More monster hunters will come after you then. And they will not hesitate. I took a deep breath and walked out. It had started to rain and the city was cold and gray around me. A hostile, threatening place. I had been a monster hunter. Now, I was a fugitive.